Great. Well, thank you, um, Drs. Kane and Kornbluth, for inviting me. And uh, Gary's made some of my job easier because he did present some of the post-op prevention studies and the scoring. What I'd like to do is I gave this talk in 2011, and I've updated since then. And Gary alluded to some of the studies that have been performed and some that are yet to come. So where do we stand in 2014, today, in terms of post-operative Crohn's disease? Still 50 to 65% of our patients require an ileocecal resection for their Crohn's disease. In 2014, Crohn's disease treatment relies on initiation of medicines in response to disease. So what does that mean? You see a patient in your office newly diagnosed with Crohn's disease. The symptoms brought them to see you. The diagnosis is made, but when the actual Crohn's disease started is still a bit unknown, meaning they've probably had disease for some time. So in some patients presenting to your office for the first time, their tissue damage may be progressed enough that surgery may be an appropriate first step. And I'd like to submit that surgery should not be considered a failure, and it's how we medically prevent and manage post-op Crohn's that's the trick. So Gary's actually shown this slide already, but just to take you through this in a, a brief way, and I actually have to credit Jean-Fred for providing some of the uh, pictures on this slide. So let's imagine for a minute that on the left-hand side of this, where the red arrow is, your patient goes to surgery. What happens to that patient one week after surgery? If you look at the macroscopically normal neoterminal ileum, so no endoscopic lesions, one week after surgery and do biopsies, in a majority of patients, histologically, there's already evidence of Crohn's disease recurrence. Go to your right more, and Gary mentioned Paul Rutgerd's data and really the pioneer in this study of endoscopic recurrence. 70 to 90% of your patients who are clinically silent, meaning they have no symptoms, have disease recurrence endoscopically. Move to your right. We know it's a progressive tissue damaging disease. It starts to show up on radiographs. By five years, 60% of patients will have clinical symptoms of recurrence. And what this ultimately means is that the majority, about half of these patients, need another surgery. So that's the old story with Crohn's. The other thing I'd like to pause for a minute is this is also a useful insight into all immune-mediated diseases. And what do I mean by that? This is the one area where we can actually resect the disease portion, reconnect, and essentially wipe the slate clean and start over. So we don't wipe the immunology clean. The genetics are the same, and the environment, you could argue, is the same. And we know exactly where disease recurrence occurs. So when you see a patient for the first time, forget surgery, when you see a patient for the first time in your office with symptoms from Crohn's disease, and you do a colonoscopy or radiograph, you say, this is terrible. Probably they had clinically silent progression until finally the tissue damage was enough that they felt this. And this is something we're learning from the post-op model. We're looking at now genetics, immunology, some of the microbiome as well. Gary also showed this slide, and Paul Rutgerts has really been the endoscopic master in defining post-operative recurrence for us. And we've assigned some scoring system, and Paul's really done this, a zero and one, so either normal or less than one, five aptus ulcers, we have termed endoscopic remission, and endoscopic recurrence we have assigned to a score of two, three, or four. I want to pause for a minute and caution all of us on one thing, and, and Barry, uh, Gary did allude to this as well. Paul Rutgerts, when he initially designed this study in 1990, this was meant to predict who is going to have a clinical and a surgical recurrence. We, myself included, are guilty, have applied this non-validated medicine treatment scoring system to post-op Crohn's, where we say remission 01, recurrence 2, 3, or 4. So I just want to mention that it's not technically validated for treatment trials, although I think all of us are comfortable with using that. We also know from his study that over 70% of patients in his study had an endoscopic recurrence one year later, and the majority of those patients actually were clinically silent, clinically asymptomatic. So we know that there's a disconnect between mucosal recurrence and symptoms in the post-op setting. Well, how do we treat post-op Crohn's? And I think historically there have been a number of studies looking at 5 aminosalicylates, antibiotics, corticosteroids, and then yesterday Jean-Fred Colombel went through some of the data on 6-MPAs of thyperin for post-op Crohn's. 
Where do anti-TNFs fall into this treatment cascade? How do we follow these patients post-operatively? Should we do a colonoscopy? What about fecal calprotectin? In Italy and Canada, what about small bowel ultrasound? Is that a predictable way of uh, measuring for recurrence? So the medications in the pre-anti-TNF era and post-op Crohn's are really summarized in this uh, slide. So on the left-hand column, placebo, 5-ASA, budesonide, nitromidazole antibiotics, which includes metronidazole in this country, or nidazole in Europe, and then azathioprine and 6-MP. And I think a couple of things to note on this slide. In terms of clinical recurrence, that's probably a very poor predictor of post-op Crohn's, but clinical recurrence didn't differ too much compared to placebo. Endoscopic recurrence, which is probably the more validated and important measure in measuring postoperative recurrence, most of the studies still did not show a benefit over placebo. Some notable exceptions. Look at the nitromidazole antibiotic data and clinical recurrence, very low. So I would challenge those in the audience that are studying the microbiome. If we could come up with a safe, effective microbiome altering medication that's probably the treatment, not only for post-op Crohn's, but you could argue for IBD in general. Jean-Fred Colombel mentioned yesterday there have been five post-op 6-MPAs at thioprine studies. Half of them were negative and half of them were positive. So where does that play a role? Out of these options, there was one study that Gert Dons had actually published a, couple of year, a few years back where the yellow is azathioprine after receiving metronidazole after surgery, and the red bar is placebo after metronidazole. And interestingly, the combination of metronidazole and azathioprine reduced postoperative recurrence. But look at the slide. Still 44% of the patients who received that had an endoscopic recurrence. So what does this mean? This means that out of these studies, still about half of the patients will have recurrence of disease, which means that based on Paul Rutgeard's data, these patients may present with clinical and surgical recurrence in the future. So what about post-op anti-TNF? And I think in the last five years, there's been a lot of discussion. And the question is, is this worth the hype? So Pittsburgh likes hype. So thank you very much. There, I can tell there are some Pittsburgh uh, fans in the audience. It's interesting, when you go to away Steelers games, I think Pittsburghers travel better than any, any city in the country. Um, I would say the same for this audience. It's interesting, every time I show Pittsburgh slides, the Pittsburgh fans, so I, I'm expecting terrible towels at the next uh, conference. But uh, nonetheless, we like hype. So this is a study that I've shown before that we published in 2009 which I won't belabor too much, but this was the randomized two-arm double-blind placebo-controlled study. We did a sample power size, so yes, it was a small study, but we assumed an 80% endoscopic recurrence at one year in placebo, and we assumed a 21% recurrence in our infliximab group. We had no data. And remember that number 21, because it's gonna come back in a couple of slides. And then after the patients had surgery, we randomized them either to infliximab three-dose induction every eight weeks for a year or placebo. Some of these patients came in on immunomodulators. We didn't stop them. Some of these patients were on five ASAs. We didn't stop those. This was a high-risk group. All of these patients but two had perforating disease. Most had or were smokers, about half were smokers, and about a third of the patients had had recurrent surgery, so high-risk group. And what we found, placebo in red, infliximab in yellow, that there was a large difference between endoscopic recurrence at one year with high statistical significance. It's important when you read any post-op study today to look at the scores. And Gary mentioned that between a score of one, less than five ulcers, and two, more than five ulcers, I'd probably tell you, who cares if somebody has six ulcers versus four, we're gonna say the six is recurrence and four is remission. You all know that that's kind of ridiculous. So when you look at these studies, look at zero and look at three and four. So in this study, we found that most of our infliximab patients had a score of zero and over half of the placebo patients had a score of three or four. So this is only one small study. We need more data. And it's interesting, about two months ago, I saw one of the original patients I enrolled way back one in the office, and he said to me, Dr. Rigero, this is amazing. 24 patients, 
have created such a stir? And I said, that's true, we need more data. But he said, you know, you should get a bus and you should drive us all around and make sure nothing happens to us. So now we have the Pittsburgh post-op bus. I'm the driver. We have 24 patients, and I followed them because in a minute I'm going to show you that we followed these patients for eight years, so I feel like I've attached and have some personal relationships. So it's kind of interesting in this small study we've learned so much. But that's one small study. What are the other data we have? So the top four studies, this is endoscopic recurrence rates at six months to two years after surgery. Top four studies in blue are with infliximab. The bottom six studies are with adalibumab. Interestingly, if you look at the middle column under anti-TNF, the endoscopic recurrence rate at six months to two years after surgery is zero to 21%. The thing that I was happy to see, and my biostatistician was even more happy to see, is our power calculation initially for post-op recurrence with infliximab was 21%. And we actually found that two of the studies had a rate of 21%. The control was clearly higher, although azathioprine in a couple of the studies had rates of 40%. So you could say that there's still a signal there. These are the references which are in your syllabus. Most recently, this past fall, there was a meta-analysis out of all of the post-operative studies. So they combined all of the studies done in post-operative Crohn's to date. I'm not going to belabor this too much, but these are the clinical remission rates one year after post-op. If you see the red arrow, that's the line of unity. Most of you are used to looking at these risk stratifications and odds ratios and meta-analysis. But anything to the left of the line, if there was a line drawn there, would favor conventional non-anti-TNF treatment. Anything to the right of the line favors anti-TNF. Now you can see most of the lines cross one. And I would argue that clinical remission, clinical recurrence is not a good standard to follow post-operative Crohn's disease. Nonetheless, this meta-analysis suggested clinical recurrence was better. Endoscopic remission was a better, and, and I think most of the studies were more consistent in this regard. None of the studies touched the line of one, and if you look at that black diamond, that's even further to the right of the line, which suggests significance. Interestingly, and Dave Rubin has looked at this in terms of dysplasia risk, but there have been a couple of studies, ours and one other, that looked at histology as far as an endoscopic recurrence. And we still don't know what to make out of macroscopic normal histology, but we may get some signals that histologic changes on a normal neoterminal ileum may impact future recurrence, but stay tuned on that. There was one comparative effective study, and actually this is probably not a study that many of you have seen. I'm not going to go through all the methodology, but this is looking at endoscopic recurrence A, histologic recurrence B, clinical recurrence C. For dark is infliximab, the lighter gray is adalibumab. Now the 30% is the top line, so this isn't out of 100%. But essentially, this is one of the first comparative effective studies that I've seen, certainly in Crohn's disease, and you see a similarity between the two. And note that the clinical remission rate was quite low. So what about long-term post-op Crohn's disease? So you could argue, who cares at one year whether they have recurrence or not? We want to know what happens long-term. So these are, uh, this is a study we just published uh, recently in CGH, and I'm just going to briefly talk you through this and take you through the results of this, which Tom Ullman used in the debate yesterday against me, so I'm now going to use it in my favor. But nonetheless, these are patients who had surgery, randomized to infliximab or placebo, and at the end of one year, we know that the patients in infliximab, the majority of them did not have a recurrence endoscopically. But then what happened, and just to put, take you through the trial, so at the end of the year, I did the colonoscopy on the patient. We were blinded to whether they had placebo or infliximab. We did not know what they had. So the reason I say this is I think this speaks to human nature and speaks to an interesting aspect of shared decision, meaning I walked out, and the majority of these patients, not knowing what they're on, I say, you know what? You have zero. Most of you had zero. One of you had one, and there was one that actually had a three. And then we said, we have some options here. We don't know what you were on. We can continue infliximab, assuming you were on it. We can start it, assuming you weren't on it. Or we can do nothing. Interestingly, the majority of these patients did not continue infliximab, given the choice, because they felt well and it looked normal. Only three of them continued infliximab. And again, this was blinded. 
So we filed them out to eight years, and this is one of the patients on the bus, so there's been no recurrence and no surgery. But looks what, look what happens to the patients who stopped. They felt well, it looked normal at a year, they didn't have disease. Eight of the patients had endoscopic recurrence, and five actually have had another surgery within an eight-year time period. So small numbers, yes, but interesting signal. What about placebo? So Gary mentioned the poker study, which isn't exactly this, because this is a one-year recurrence on placebo. So 11 of these patients had recurrence. Human nature, you come out and you tell the patient, we talk about mucosal healing. Our patients care about mucosal healing. They had endoscopically active disease. They were given a choice. 12 of the patients said, I'd like to start infliximab. Again, not knowing that they were on placebo. So they received placebo, uh, infliximab every eight weeks and looks what happens to them. Interestingly, at eight years, five still had endoscopic recurrence and those patients went to surgery. What does this mean? This means in patients who have a score of three or four, and Paul Rutger has shown us, we can't reverse disease once it gets too late. Once we pass that tipping point, our best medicines may not be able to reverse disease. One patient lost insurance and, and couldn't uh, go on any treatment, and they have had another surgery. So how should we manage our post-op Crohn's patients? And I'll now end with my perspective and how I approach, and this actually hasn't changed. So one thing that's consistently as more studies come out, this has not changed the way I practice. So I do take into account risk factors. Some relative risk factors are early age of surgery, short time to first surgery, and having ileocolonic disease, meaning rather than isolated ileum or isolated colon. Risk factors that we know have been associated with post-op recurrence are active cigarette smoking, and hint, hint, while this is on the answer to the, uh, the response system, this actually has not been proved, but this is my personal belief. So careful how you answer the question, although the right answer is including this. Um, so people who had been on weight-based immunomodulators and methotrexate and progressed despite being on treatment, and I'm not saying the patient that two months ago you threw on methotrexate or azathioprine, but you knew they needed surgery. I'm talking about the patients who had inflammatory disease, treated in the best monotherapy immunomodulator way, and still progressed to surgery. I put them at a higher risk in terms of considering post-op treatment. We know penetrating disease has been related to post-op recurrence, and we know the patients who've had multiple surgeries. So here's my approach. Not every patient gets anti-TNF. You've probably seen this before, and I still practice the same way, but it merits because we still get questions on how to manage this. So what about the low-risk patient? You probably can't read at the bottom, but these are patients who've had disease long-standing, more than 20 years, who come to their first surgery for a short stricture and really don't have a, a big inflammatory component. Quite honestly, this is probably only about 10 to 15% of patients, but that's a patient I would do nothing after surgery. The difference today, conversely, 10 years ago, is now we're looking at six to 12 months. So the biggest difference is I leave this patient alone, scope them at six to 12 months. If they have recurrence, we go into the scope saying we're gonna treat you. The moderate risk group, so Jean-Fred mentioned immunomodulators yesterday. The moderate risk group are less than 10 years who come in with a longer stricture and have an inflammatory component, but really haven't received aggressive treatment, and they come to their first surgery. I think if they can tolerate metronidazole, using that in combination with azathioprine 6-MP is still reasonable. People sometimes ask, well, why don't you just use anti-TNF in everybody? One, cost. Two, and as John Fred pointed out yesterday, probably 30 to 40% of patients will still do very well with immunomodulators alone. The high-risk group are penetrating disease, those with more than two surgeries. These are the patients that I'm currently targeting my practice for a post-op anti-TNF. We're doing a colonoscopy again within a year and then making decisions based on recurrence or not at that point. So coming next year, and if I have the opportunity and fortune to come back and present to you, we will have the PREVENT study, which is a large international study that was based off of some of these small data. And that's something that we're going to hopefully present at DDW. We submitted the abstract on Monday, so hopefully at DDW I'll have the opportunity to present that. Uh, this is not Pittsburgh. Uh, this is England, Stonehenge, and thank you very much.